This is Rudy Giuliani back with another episode of Rudy's Common Sense. Today's episode is uh, quite a significant one because it deals with a documentary that has um, repercussions that I, I, I don't think we can even measure yet. And I'm going to get right to the two people, along with Dinesh D'Souza, who were the most responsible for it. In fact, these are the people who did the, the work that gathered this extraordinary information, and that's uh, Catherine Engelbrecht and uh, Greg Phillips. So let me go to Catherine first, because I'd like her to describe the organization, or one of the organizations, primary one behind this, True the Vote, and how it started and what the purpose of it was. Hello, Catherine, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for your contribution, it's uh, extraordinary. Uh, Catherine, tell us how True the Vote started uh, that ended up in this extraordinary documentary. Sure. Well, True the Vote started in 2010. It was just a small group of people that um, wanted to do something that would translate their passion into, into action. And at the time, we just knew that there were not enough volunteers. So our very first foray into this entire universe of election integrity was just working at the polls. But in that process, we saw problems. Those problems begat other research efforts to understand how bad data gets into the roles. Why is the process so broken? What has preceded uh, the years upon years that have gotten the process to where it is? And that's really taken you know, the, the last decade to, to understand and, and better, better refine our methods. So when 2020 came around, uh, we knew exactly what we wanted to do. Now, uh, did you know Greg and his, and his capacity and his before that before twenty twenty? Had you worked? Yes, I, I yes, I've worked with Greg since about twenty fifteen uh, in a variety of capacities, and um, you know, no one I trust more. And so, when as we got as we got as we got closer and closer into um, what twenty twenty was shaping up to be, I reached out and said, "Hey, let's uh, let's set up a team and let you do what you do best." So when did you first do that? When, when did you first become concerned enough, suspicious enough uh, that you that you felt you had to do that? Well, I, I mean, we were we were concerned even going into uh, the latter part of 2019 because you're seeing all the lawsuits being filed and the right. consent decrees being spun up. And and it, you know, the convenient sort of fog of covid as it blanketed the country allowed for a lot of things to happen out of plain sight. So uh, we were concerned going into it. We started an election integrity hotline in September where we were taking in thousands of calls. Greg's team was already managing those calls at that point. And we began to hear some recurring themes re related to ballot trafficking. And that was really as we began to, to first realize, man, there's something that's going on here that's connected state to state. How do we measure this? And ultimately that became the, you know, the project that now is reflected in the movie 2000 Mules. Now, uh, Greg, tell us your organization and how you got started and then how the two of you got together as a team. Well, I'm an old guy in, uh, in the <laughs> political circles. I've been doing this uh, for about 40 years uh, or something like this for about 40 years. These days we call it election intelligence. Um, it's really the, the acquisition um, uh, research or, or analytics around the, around the data we collect and then dissemination of that data in a variety of ways. We've done it all over the place and had a lot of uh, just great opportunities over the years. This particular one was so important. Um, Catherine's um, sort of spidey sense, I guess might be a way to put it, uh, was really <laughs> up in the election. And, uh, and as she began to articulate all of the challenges that she felt like we were all going to face, and then, of course, President Trump coming out and saying, look, this mail-in thing is going to be a disaster, guys. Everybody's got to focus yeah. and pay attention. Um, Catherine had long said that, look, the, the, the prelude for all of this had been set, Greg, by dirty voter rolls. They're not cleaning the voter rolls. So if you start mass mailing applications to everyone on the voter rolls, you know, you could be in big trouble doing that. Um, and if they don't clean your voter rolls for a couple of years, like places like Georgia had done, uh, then, you know, you could be looking at potentially 20, 25 percent of the rolls, either inactive, ineligible or otherwise, you know, not, you know, shouldn't be voting. You take all that big mess and mail them all an application or mail them all a ballot. And it's the recipe for disaster. She was spot on with it. President Trump was spot on with it. 
uh, Mayor, I know that you were saying you and your team were talking about it early on. I mean, this was this was a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, once we began to, I guess, unpack all of the the data that was coming in, whether it be from the hotlines, uh, we had witnesses calling, we had just citizens calling saying, "Hey, I saw this or I saw that." Those threads all. Um, were, were they, they felt very similar to us. And it was in that similarity that we were able to form some hypotheses, buy some data, and really embark on what ultimately became the, the 2000 Mules movement. Well, I think the thing that you did that really was uh, ingenious and also makes it much easier to understand than the entire uh, voter um, lack of integrity or entire voter theft, which had many, many parts to it. Some of it not enough to affect the election, but still quite concerning. Underage people voting, dead people voting, people voting from different states. None of those added up usually to enough to change the result. But together, they became a a significant number. That's a lot for people to, to gather. You focused in on one thing that's easy to focus on, hard to do, but easy to focus on. And... Uh, I must say, I, I, it took me a while to trace back to the boxes. I knew from the beginning, from the day after the election, that it was stolen. And I knew it was a conspiracy because I was notified within two hours from five jurisdictions that the Democrats were doing precisely the same thing. They had gone, on, gone out, they had bought fences in five places, all crooked Democratic cities, my background is as a prosecutor, so I don't say that lightly. And uh, they kept Republicans behind those barriers and didn't allow a Republican to see a single piece of paper. And I had been a poll watcher. I, I had sat through many mail-in voters where I sat on one place, Democrats sat on the other. I looked at it, no, that's not the right signature. Yes, that is. No, that isn't. And I go see in Philadelphia... 100 Republican poll watchers like cows behind a fence. And, and the man in charge kept record of it. 600,000 ballots were counted without a single Republican looking at it. Then I found out the same thing happened in Pittsburgh, different numbers, same exact thing in Michigan, same exact thing in Atlanta, same exact thing in Maricopa County, and the same exact thing in Nevada, which we never challenged because of the legislature. The minute I heard that, I said, this is a conspiracy. Everybody didn't wake up that morning and say, let me go buy fences. (laughs) Let me put the Republicans behind fences like they're cows. We never did that before. There's got to be something wrong with the paper. But what you did, you found out what's wrong with the paper. So explain to us, because I have to tell you, what you did seems almost impossible to me. And when did this technology of geo-tracking start? When you started doing voter integrity, there wasn't this technology. Isn't that right, Greg? Yeah, no, it, it definitely did not exist. Uh, 2011 or so, we began to see the early pieces of, of this geolocation or this uh, the collection of these ag keys coming off of the phones. Um, and the signals themselves were, were, um, were being gathered, but they weren't being gathered in earnest. In 2015, the most of the apps made some changes. Apple, Google, and everybody else uh, made changes in the way they were collecting data. Uh, and from there, they made the data accessible via something called an SDK. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a type of software that allows apps to be able to easily exchange data with, with someone else. And it was in those SDKs that these free apps, there are 360,000 or so apps these days that collect this data about usage. In other words, who you are, where you are on the earth, and then send that to be collected by these brokers. It, once 2015's changes really sort of came into play, into play uh, it, it changed the entire game because now we have the ability to go in and buy trillions of these signals that are emitted and by linking them together you create a pattern of life and that pattern of life is where they go where they work you know driving from my house to my office i mean how how many people do that every day other than me right and so the (laughs) the ability to really begin to understand how a person actually operates and really catherine's um 
thought around this was, Greg, if we do this, you can't be wrong. First of all, it's something we still laugh about to these days. You can't be wrong. So, okay, <laughs> oh, wrong. Yeah. I, prom oh, yeah. I promise. One time, right? Um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 but what she also, what she also was sort of thoughtful about was, look, what if we, what if we buy before early voting started and after early voting started that way we can see the pattern of life and the changes in the pattern of life so if we see people never going to drop boxes and then all of a sudden early voting starts and they're going to drop boxes and then election stops and they stop going to drop boxes. i don't remember that was that point made in the movie in the documentary there was a lot it. there was a lot that was no we got that, that that's a that's a, from a from the point of view of a trial lawyer that's a very, very powerful piece of evidence, man. I'd love to have that at trial. All right, well, Catherine. Yeah, Catherine's yeah. idea was was That's really brilliant. genius, and in and in Georgia, Mayor should be a lawyer. Cat, are you a lawyer, Catherine? No, but I play one during elections. Yeah, anytime you want to try a anyone you anytime you want to try a case, I, I'll get you one. I mean that that that. In other words, you take one singular person, and up until a certain date, he never has this pattern, and then all of a sudden, for four straight weeks, he has this pattern. And then he stops it. <laughs> wow. Well, how the media just went... can't can't deal with this, Mayor. I mean, the you know the New York Times and WAPO and everybody else. They're like, no, no, you can't do that. I I read that this, and I, they're, they're just losing their minds because they have no response to it all. The technology is legit. the The data is immutable. The, the hypotheses and, and our conclusions and our methods are proven. And you lay on top of that video and it's a silver. Yeah. Yeah. You know, before the way you do the documentary, you do the geo tracking first and you explain it. And to me, as a lawyer, that would be sufficient circumstantial evidence because you have so much of it. And now that you add the fact that you have the comparison to before, you really have a powerful circumstantial case. But the minute you lay on top of that, even four or five uh, videos, you make apparent now directly what's going on. But tell me, Catherine, when did you become aware of this technology, the, the, the geo tracking? It's called geo tracking technology? Um, well, I think we tangentially knew about it for the last few years. Greg's been you know, in the space a lot longer and has watched as it's developed. I knew it just from marketing applications. You know, this is sure. the same type of technology that causes your phone to go off when you pull up into your pharmacy or into a Starbucks. It's the same thing. Um, I've known that it's been used in that way. So we just decided to uh, flip the script a little bit and use it in, in, a, in a novel way that um, people weren't really expecting. When you first made that decision to do it, were, were you at all concerned that the enormity of the data that you had to analyze would make it impossible to do it in the time that you had? Um, I think so. Uh, well, I, I think that all of those things were, were considerations, but you know, the broadest consideration was that we were going all in. I mean, as an organization, we put everything we had into one direction and we could have been wrong. I mean, there might have been nothing there and that would have been okay. If the data would have shown nothing, well, then the answer was, it, you know, our hypothesis was that drop boxes would be abused. We could be wrong. Um, you know, and that would have been all right. But that's that's not what we found. We're now going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Think your homeowner's insurance covers home title fraud? <laughs> Think again. And neither does your common identity theft program. The FBI calls home title fraud one of the fastest growing crimes, which is why you need to go to HomeTitleLock.com, America's leader in home title protection. Here's the problem. The deed to your home is the only document that proves you own it. And the deeds to all of our homes now are online. In minutes, a criminal can find and forge your name off the deed to your home and refile as the new owner. Like Jeff, who spent a fortune in legal fees after a thief forged himself onto the deed to Jeff's home and took out loans Jeff didn't have home title lock then, he does now. Or Deborah, who thought our common identity theft service would protect her. Then a criminal got onto the deed to a home and had her evicted. Deborah has home title lock now. HomeTitleLock.com is your peace of mind and the deed to your home is protected. Visit 
HomeTitleLock.com. HomeTitleLock.com. Welcome back. I, I always thought, from the first time I heard about this, even in its infant stage, or maybe a, oh, maybe a year ago, whatever, that, that you had a whistleblower that gave you the pattern, and therefore you had like a, a prototype, and you could go in with the pro, like s- someone who did this, who came to you and said, they paid me money, I went to 20 drop boxes, I did it for two weeks. You, d- d- you didn't have that at the beginning. Well, I'll, I'll let Greg explain it, but we actually did have that in a number of states. Oh, the interesting, that's very helpful. It, yeah, it's very helpful. But you know, now we look back and, and recognize we really wouldn't. I mean, it was it was helpful, I guess, at the time to sort of add some level of context. But the data so clearly shows these abusive patterns that it stands on its own. But Greg, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, the methods in geospatial analysis are are well known, and and so our job was to really create so an an, hypo, an hypothesis or several hypotheses, and the easy part about it was because there were similarities, and what we were hearing in Arizona and what we were hearing in Georgia and Milwaukee and Philadelphia, they weren't exactly the same. So we created a set of hypotheses that were sort of focused on each each uh, community. Um, we used some of the information we received from some of these witnesses, um, but we're, we're not law enforcement. We can't compel these people to do things or tell the truth or anything else. Um, but people were coming forward with, with stories that were so similar that we couldn't help but have our hypotheses in, right. uh, established in a similar manner. Ultimately, as Catherine said, the 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 analytics that go around this, we probably could have done it with even without that, uh, but it really helped us hone in because it allowed us to refine that hypothesis and, and really figure out, okay, we, we want to be able to do this, 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 and this. And if we do that, we think we'll see this as a conclusion um, and then test it and run it through and kick things out that don't work and and, and test again and run and run and run, being ever mindful that Catherine's, you know, hanging over our shoulder saying, you can't be wrong. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it was, it was, uh, it was an incredible adventure. I mean, we had a petabyte or so of, of data, another petabyte or so of video. Tell me what a pet, petabyte is. I'm not sure people. A thousand, a thousand terabytes is a petabyte. So, oh, wow. you know, but, you know, it hasn't been that long since, uh, you know, you couldn't put a petabyte in a, in a, you know, a big data center. And today, you know, you can put it in a, um, you know, in a whole bunch of hard drives and, and put them in a Pelican case and carry them on an airplane, which we've recently done. So it's a, it's a different day and age. And as, as data, big data really begins to grow, that really also presents other challenges. What do you do with that? Like, how do you skinny that down? That's a lot of cycles to run just to, you know, try to find one person at one box, let alone one person at multiple boxes across multiple days and really, um, I think the the success of what we did was really centered around the quality control algorithms that we built to test our hypotheses and, and those results. So as those results came back, we were constantly checking and pulling people out that didn't, you know, that didn't make sense. Maybe, maybe a, a, what one sort of famous one amongst us was there was a firefighter that there was a box outside of his, um, outside of the fire station. And he, he, amongst all of his people, kept showing up at not only his box, but other boxes. Um, and rather than really try to sort through that, that would be something we would take out. We wouldn't include right. that firefighter. Um, and so going through that at scale with thousands and thousands and thousands of devices and really trying to understand their pattern of life. And is this something they do every day? I said in the movie, I think, you know, this isn't grandma out walking her dog. Well, we know that because we pulled all the grandmas that were out walking their dogs out of in, in the quality <laughs> control. So, so it's really a, a uh, it was a massive effort. Um, Catherine's leadership was critical. Um, the, the, the team was amazing. The data was, was how big a team, uh, 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 Catherine and Greg, how, how big a team, uh, did you have? Well, let's say just to do the technological aspect of it we had 12 on our side full-time people that that it was a labor of love for these folks i mean some of them worked 24 hour days it was common to see 18 20 hour days from these folks and 
we I mean we just got in and and Catherine when we when we first agreed to do this uh, we just said going all in and and we did and and uh, and she did and supported us throughout. Um, well, if I could if I could just ask this, if if I'm correct, so at some point in the next couple of years somebody could go back and uh, track the fact that my cell phone is here with me and your cell phone, Catherine, is with you and your cell phone is where uh, you are. And then when I get up and move later and I'm later going to drive to New Jersey in case you want to track me, I'm going to, it will tell that I went to New Jersey and stopped off at a place to do a political event with a candidate in, at, at, a, at a campaign headquarters. And then when I come home tonight, it'll, it'll show that I returned home. It'll show the places I stopped on the way home. If I stopped to eat or I stopped to fraudulently put ballots in a, uh, in, in, in a machine. But basically, th th that's for all of us who have, does the phone have to be on? It, it depends. Um, generally speaking, yes, but there are some ways and reasons why the phone being off also makes a difference. Um, for instance, Americans don't turn their phones off very often. Right. And, and you can see patterns sometimes where bad guys are going to do bad things. And just before they do it, they turn their phone off. Um, and so we, we actually can ascertain information from the pattern of how they turn on and off their phone. But even more than that, there are different ways that these signals are collected. So they're collected via Bluetooth. They're collected via Wi-Fi. If you have I a see. cell phone on, you might have your, your Apple Watch on. There's all different ways that the phones and the, uh, emit these signals. And so it's important for us to really understand that pattern of life and how someone operates. Um, so if the person never, never turns off their phone and uh, just before they show up at a ballot drop box, um, you know, they turn off their phone, uh, depending on when they turn it off and, and the length of time that it's off, that may or may not be included in, in our work. But that might be better. analysis is a very sophisticated. Yeah. In some ways, that might be better. That might be better evidence. Right. Uh, if they kept doing it at each time. Catherine, when did you realize that you had, uh, before we get to the, the video, when did you realize that you, you kind of had it? You know, this, this, this is real, and now we're going to really go forward, and, uh, and we, we've already found it, and now we're going to find more of it. Well, when we first started, our focus was initially looking at the runoff data in Georgia. So we started with that December data, and um, then we had an opportunity to, I mean, we saw patterns emerging, and, and, and we thought, well, if that was what was happening in the runoff, now let's look back into 2020. And once we began to really see the, the commonality among those two cycles in the same state, I mean, it was like, wow. this, is, this is happening. This is really happening at scale, which we'd long thought, but to see it, um, and then to see it continue to be proven out. Um, it, and that's, of course, you know, as soon as we could, we started taking this to law enforcement, uh, anticipating that they would get in, you know, over now a year ago. But uh, we've, we've learned a lot of hard lessons along the way. Wow. So it was after the election that you first started to do the analysis on the runoff. And the same thing was happening. Then when you went back, you found the same pattern, runoff and general election. Right. Which means there was no correction made between the general election, and many people thought there'd be a correction made for the runoff, because everyone knew that something went wrong in Georgia. They wouldn't know with precision what you knew, but there were so many things: underage people voting, uh, uh, a whole a whole voting center closed down, and votes c c uh, counted without Republican observers. So many people coming forward. I think Senator Ligon had something like 300 witnesses at three hearings, all of whom testified to anything from one little piece of voter fraud to, to a rather substantial amount. But they made no changes. So then you, then you went back from the runoff to the general election, and you found the same thing. When did you get to the point of looking for the videos? 
Uh, well, immediately we started in oh. immediately uh, with open records requests, and 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 then it just that it's that in and of itself became a battle. Um, starting with the runoff election uh, videos, and then expanding out, and then expanding into other states, and um, that's what the True the Vote side was working on was all of the open records requests and assembling all of the chain of custody documents and all of the video and um, any other collateral information that would help contextualize what we were looking at. Um, and it, that, that, that was also just a, a haul upstream the entire way to fight to get the videos and then to try to figure out how to use the videos so often given to us in varying levels of disrepair. So, um, and that process continues. We're still looking at video. So now where did you get video from? I know there were some states you did and some states you didn't. So it was hit and miss everywhere. Um, in, in Georgia, uh, we, we, got, we have the most video, but there's still no single area that is complete. Uh, there's always and inexplicably huge tranches missing. So we've documented all that in complaints to the state. Uh, then you look around at the other jurisdictions. Um, uh, Wisconsin, we, there was no video in uh, Milwaukee County, but we've just learned that there was some in Green Bay. So we're just waiting to get that in. Uh, Wayne County, Detroit, we have video from. Um, Philadelphia County, there was no video. So, I mean, I think the most frustrating thing about that whole situation is that broadly, America believed that, hey, the drop boxes are being put out, but they're being properly monitored. And that simply wasn't the case. The, the operative word in 2020 was lawless. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a free for all. Do you have any general idea let's say in Philadelphia, the percentage of boxes that were videoed. Oh, we don't have any video from Philadelphia. You have, do, do, do you know if they did the video and they're just not giving it to you or? Well, they hide behind a unique provision um, that they have, it's called, their, their standard is called a right to know. And they hide behind a unique provision that, um, you have to be a Philadelphia resident to request it. And that has been our deal killer inexplicably. Um, that plus, plus then refiling w on behalf of Philadelphia residents and then getting stonewalled. So, you know, it, it's, it's just been one thing after the next. I will add this. You didn't say it. You realize you're dealing with probably one of the two or three most corrupt cities in the country with a 50 year long history of, uh, massive corruption. The other thing that's the other thing that uh, uh, that I can add to what you did in the places that you selected. Every single one of them has a long history of corruption, Democrat control and corruption. Atlanta, several mayors have gone to jail. Philadelphia, I couldn't tell you how many public officials have gone to jail. Detroit, legendary. Maricopa County, get, getting that way. And did we mention Atlanta, Georgia, where, uh, gosh, the, the newly elected mayor, his vice mayor, is already under investigation and headed for jail. So the Democrats, uh, to me, when I first noted it the day after the election, the fact that they stopped voting in the same places, and then they had uh, this extraordinary exclusion of all Republicans from what is it, a time-honored practice of both looking at the ballots. I mean, you remember back with the Chads in 2000, they would hold up the ballot, and even then the Republican would say yes and the Democrat would say no, or they both say no or they both say yes. So this, this idea of Republican-Democrat looking at it, it's almost taken for granted when you do a count. And all of a sudden, thousands of Republicans are put behind barriers, and there was even physical violence to keep them away. It's outrageous. So, but it was just, de it was just they, they didn't select you know, Omaha, Nebraska, or they selected cities where they have complete control over the police, the sheriff, the judiciary, uh, with long histories of corruption, where they can do anything they want. And boy, cracking through it the way you did is... Oh, it's an un unbelievable piece of work and, and uh, act of patriotism. I have to tell you that. My goodness. I, 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 I'm so glad you did this. The, now, has anybody come forward and technologically challenged, not, not 
these general words like it's false, it's debunked, it's, this is favorite Democratic words, you know. Uh, the allegations that Biden took money in Ukraine were debunked. And then you would say, well, show me the debunk memo. <laughs> and there was no debunk memo because they were never debunked. But they keep saying that about 2,000 mules. It's f f uh, faulty. It's a faulty theory. Then you ask them, well, give me one example. And they can't do that. Has anybody tried to go back and reproduce what you did to see if you did it correctly or incorrectly? Or Let's take a short break. Not long ago, Mike Lindell, the inventor of MyPillow, and his team fit me for my very own MyPillow. They also introduced me to their wide assortment of other incredible products, like their mattress topper, their sheets, towels, slippers, and more. Sleep is incredibly important to me, and I can assume for all of you. It's time you give MyPillow a try and see for yourself. Listeners have helped build MyPillow into the incredible company it is today, and Mike Lindell wants to give back to all of you. You can get great discounts on MyPillow products by going to MyPillow.com right now and seeing each of the specially priced items, including those in the Radio Listener Special Square. You're going to see rotational offers up to 66% off on products like their pillows, mattress topper, Giza sheets, but also new products like their slippers, weighted blankets, robes, and waffle blankets. All MyPillow products come with a 60-day money-back guarantee. Enter promo code RUDY for these great specials. That's MyPillow.com and use the promo code RUDY. Welcome back to the interview. No, I mean, sir, like, you know, to your point, we've had uh, the, the corporate media come out and, sure. uh, you know, try to poke holes in this, but the, they're, they're, basing, they're basing their remarks on flawed, on flawed observations on um incorrect assumptions so it's you know and, and and it's easy to do uh when the corporate media doesn't really seek to get answers you know if you don't want the if you don't want the answers you don't ask the questions and that's what they're that's what they're making sure that they're keeping in mind that they don't want to ask the right questions and without disclosing to me what you're doing are you continuing your investigation Absolutely yes, and, and and then um the next stage is what we're we're calling pull the ripcord, where we are working diligently to prepare the the data and and video in a way that that Americans can have access to it, and and we can with full transparency show. I mean, look, just the video alone, getting eyes on that in, in a crowdsource, people are going to find far more than what we found. But but even more importantly, I think it's to to be able to see. Uh, what really happened so that we can know going forward so that you can see the problems that occurred in 2020 so that it can be improved in 2022 and 2024. We really need to shine a light on what's wrong and then work diligently to correct it moving forward. And then when you calculated the numbers, they, they all turned out in each one of these jurisdictions, if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to be dispositive. In other words, they were, the numbers were numbers that would uh, materially change the result of the, of the election, that Trump had actually gotten more votes than Biden. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the, Catherine was just talking about the, uh, some of the, um, you know, how the media has reacted to all of this. I mean, they're doing all manner of crazy things. They're, they're you know, obviously disputing those numbers that you're talking about. And, and you know, these, these things are real. I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, we we went and said, OK, well, we think this happened, so we're going to make these numbers up. It, it just didn't happen that way. I mean, the data yeah, supports our, our decisions. Well, I have to tell you, um, I have so much admiration for you. But most importantly, I think the whole country does. You've, you've done us a, a remarkable, remarkable uh, act of patriotism, because if this election uh, is allowed to go by the way it was conducted, because what you're displaying is really one of several methods of extreme fraud. Uh, this could become the pattern for the rest of, uh, of America forever. And then we stop being America. We start to become a dictatorship. When you lose the right, when you lo we've, we've to a large extent lost the right of free speech. And if we lose the right to vote, let me ask you one last question. How much, uh, um, how much, 
pressure have you received and how much uh, how much cancellation, which I guess is a new word, have you gotten, which is really a form of persecution? I know both of you have un undergone it. We, we've gotten it and we've gotten it from both sides. Uh, there's a lot of folks, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of organizations on the left uh, that, you know, play it, play it the, the known way to cancel. But there's a lot of groups on the right that want to keep us quiet, too. Explain that to me for one second, Catherine, because I have to tell you, when I went around to state legislatures to get them to look at this and explain to them it was their responsibility to do it under the Constitution, which many of them didn't even know. They weren't aware of Article 2 of the Constitution. They seemed shocked that they had this responsibility. The young, the young members of each one of these legislatures that you're talking about, I dealt with. They were very enthusiastic about doing the right thing. But at the leadership level, I, re I got more resistance or as much uh, from the Republicans as the Democrats, including some pretty vicious things that they did to try to block this. Absolutely. Why, so within, within the Republican Party, I guess we call them rhinos, but it almost seems like there should be a, maybe Quisling would be a better name. I don't know what the right name would be. But I, I remember saying to one legislature, I might as well be dealing with a group of Democrats. Well, there's no doubt that the fraud's been institutionalized and it's happened over years and years and years. And now the, the, way, the, the way to un, unravel all of this is, is not easy. It's not going to be fixed overnight. And it's going to take people with, with you know, strong spines to stand up and say, we got we to gotta dig deep, America, and figure out why it is that we can't come to some common sense resolution around photo voter identification and limitation of mail ballots, things that the rest of the globe recognizes. I mean, our, our system has been allowed to erode to the place that it has because those in power find that to be politically expedient, politically useful. And, and, and not until America stands up and says, look, we don't want to be the laughing stock of the world relative to our elections. There are better ways. There are better technologies. We can do better. Until that happens, I'm convinced that the, the, the entrenched bureaucrats, that the swamp on both sides will never let this process go because they use it. They use it, cycle in and cycle out, and the American people's voice is becoming ever more muted. And I hold both sides responsible, and I look to the American people God for, for solutions. That is about as good an explanation as I have heard of the full scope of this problem. God bless both of you for doing this. And thank you. For, as, a, as a fellow patriot, I have a tremendous admiration for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think those interviews, uh, in addition to the one with uh, Dinesh uh, uh, Souza, that was uh, uh, put out last week, which I urge you to go back and listen to in combination with this one, uh, gives you a very, very uh, uh, good basis on which to um, certainly quite responsibly allege that the election, <laughs> that the election of 2020 was uh, subjected to massive fraud. And in just one uh, area, one discipline, uh, enough fraud to uh, change the result of the election. Uh, I'll leave it uh, for you to watch it and make your own conclusions because at the end or toward the end, Dinesh summarizes uh, various ways in which the vote changed. Uh, suffice it to say that any fair-minded person uh, would certainly at least come to the conclusion that they should apologize to all of those who allege that it was a stolen election and apologize to them because whether they agree or not as to whether it was stolen, there certainly was a strong, strong, and is a strong, strong basis for massive election fraud. We have put together, I think, the most extensive and inclusive voter fraud organization in the history of American politics. Let me say it again. The 2020 election was the most secure election in American history. Let me begin by asking a very simple question. Do we know the truth about what really happened in the 2020 election? I think millions of Americans know something went wrong, and they have little pieces, and no one's really put it together. I'm agnostic on this question, 
and I, I am awaiting more information. If I believed the president were a Nazi, I might steal an election. Bold accusations require bold evidence, and they haven't seen it. We have been working on something big. Show me the money. Can we meet? I've been working with Greg Phillips. He has a deep background in election intelligence. True the Vote has the largest store of election intelligence for the 2020 elections in the world. No one has more data than we do. We identified in Atlanta 242 mules that went to an average of 24 drop boxes. But Philadelphia alone, we've identified more than 1,100 mules. What is a mule? person picking up ballots and running them to the drop boxes. This is not grandma out walking her dog. Bad backgrounds, bad reputations. They are interested in one thing, that's money. And in no shape, in no way, in no time is that legal. This is organized crime. Do you have video evidence? Four million minutes of surveillance video around the country. What you're about to see is disturbing. So this is uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. Don't we all vote at 1 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> On one night, this person, this mule, went across six counties to 27 different drop boxes. I call it the Mexican Mafia, seriously, because uh, they, they work like that. This is jaw-dropping. What you showed is frightening. It's just sickening to me. Now we come to the most important question of all. Was the magnitude of vote trafficking enough to tip the balance in the 2020 presidential election? It's not a leap to say this would have made a difference. They have ruined election day in the United States of America. That's provable. And that's enough for me to fight the left with every fiber in my body. Without free and fair elections, we are not a democracy. We are a criminal cartel masquerading as a democracy. 2,000 mules in select theaters, May 2nd and 4th. Virtual premiere, May 7th. Stream May 8th at Salem Now or Locals.